All right, we're two minutes past, and uh, we'll uh, get started in the next minute. Uh, while we're doing that, uh, this is meant to be just as a as a starting point. This is meant to be more of an open presentation from our side. We've done webinars before where it was more of a walkthrough of the product. This is very much us presenting research that we've either done or found interesting. So very much want to uh, feel you know feel open to ask questions or uh, or comment, and uh, definitely want to have an open discourse. And as we're uh, going through everything here, so we either have the question and uh, question and answer feature, which feel free to run through that, or just going through the webinar chat, and uh, we'll be monitoring those as we're running through. And with that taken care of, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. This is our first lunch and learn uh, with Neural Magic. We've done this internally quite a bit um, with our own uh, team, and primarily just so we could share research across the team, make sure everybody's staying up to date, and figure out what uh, what we might want to work on in terms of next research areas for uh, for the company. With that, we've decided to start open sourcing our lunch and learn, keeping in uh, in theme with our push for open source and contributions with the community. So we've decided to open source our lunch and learn once a month with uh, the external community and uh, and be able to talk through and present either our research or other research that we found interesting in the neural network and machine learning space. For this one, we'll specifically be going through how well do sparse models transfer? And we'll be walking through that. My name is Mark Kurtz. I uh, direct our machine learning team here at Neural Magic. And if there's, you know, if you don't have a chance to get a question answered through the chat or Q&A, please feel free to uh, join our Slack community. We have a lot of people available there. All of our engineers and staff are on there uh, to help out and more than happy to walk through, as well as check out our GitHub and follow us on Twitter. So diving in, going through today's agenda, we'll start off with a little bit of background on uh, sparse models, right, and transfer learning, running through why they're important and, and overall what they are. And that'll set us up to dive into the research that uh, that we've actually done internally at Neural Magic and uh, presented at uh, CVPR as well as EMNLP coming up. So we have image classification, specifically how well do sparse image net models transfer, a paper that we had at CVPR. Uh, we'll run through the motivation, contribution, and results for that paper. Additionally, uh, within that paper, we had segmentation and detection results, so we'll run through those as well. And then after that, we'll run through NLP. How well does this work in NLP, specifically through our the Optimal BERT Surgeon paper? And this is a paper that uh, we put in at EMNLP and we'll be presenting at the next conference as it's been accepted. Uh, and additionally, we'll be running through the motivation, contribution, and results that we have from that paper and how that applies to sparse transfer as well. And then finally, we'll go through conclusion and discussion. And then, sorry, I just had a Q&A that came through that said that chat is disabled. So let me see if I can fix that real fast. All right, I think that, let me see. Okay, that should have fixed it. Let me know if that did not fix uh, fix the issue, but uh, hopefully you should be able to go through the chat now. And uh, actually, just to start off, everyone, go ahead and, and type in the chat where you're calling in from. We'd love to see uh, everybody that we have in available before we start diving into uh, today's agenda. Uh, so for Neural Magic, we're in Boston, located in Boston, Massachusetts, and I'm actually calling in from, uh, uh, from Medford, Massachusetts. We have a few people coming in, quite quite a few from uh, all over the U.S., which is great to see, um, East Coast, West Coast, and uh, also some people from South America, India, and uh, and Middle East. So this is great, and uh, Canada, awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining in. I know uh, this is a little obviously different times across uh, across the country, early morning on the and across the world, early morning on the east or on the West Coast. Uh, midday in the East Coast, and then uh, India getting into night and Europe uh, early dinner. So thank you everyone for joining in. All right, so diving into the background. What are sparse models? So definition of sparse is that something that's thinly scattered or distributed. 
And whenever we apply this definition to neural networks, it ends up being the removal of information as compared to some baseline model. So there are different types of sparsity in neural networks, and we'll go through a few. Um, ultimately, we have activation sparsity, which is after the information has flow, flowed through a uh, fully connected or convolutional layer and through an activation, then there can be activation sparsity that comes out of that. So zeros present in the activations coming out. And this is typically what we'll see with array loop based networks. We do actually have some other research that was published previously on activation sparsity. But for today, we'll be focused primarily on kernel sparsity. And this is zeros that are introduced into the parameters or connections. So pruning and the rest of this presentation focuses on kernel sparsity. And this means it's the process of removing parameters within the network. So we have a very large network, very over-parameterized. We want to be able to remove all that redundancy from those networks. And um, we'll go through why. And, uh, in, uh, in two slides. We have many different methods that do this, Magnitude, Movement, and Wood Fisher. We'll go through a little bit later on, especially in the NLP, on uh, Wood Fisher and second order methods. But Magnitude, just to, just to give a brief overview, Magnitude is a zeroth order method. Essentially, as we're training, we're going to remove the weights that are closest to zero. So essentially, as SGD is regularizing uh, these weights, it's getting rid of the weights that don't matter. Those are getting regularized towards zero, and those are assumed to be the safe ones that we can remove as we're pruning. So we're just going to get rid of those, set them to zero, and introduce sparsity. Movement pruning is an example of a first-order method where we're trending um, either away or towards zero. So it's looking at the gradients coming in as well as the magnitude. And if the weight is trending away from zero, then it's thought that that is a weight that should be kept. If it's trending towards zero, that's thought as a weight that should be removed and therefore set to zero because it is getting regularized towards zero. And then finally, we have Wood Fisher and uh, MFAC and Obert, which are methods on the second order uh, method. And we'll dive into that in more detail on what that means. But at a high level, we're trying to approximate uh, second order information so that we can remove uh, the weights that affect the loss the least and try and measure that, that impact directly. And then there are two core types, structured and unstructured. Throughout this presentation, we'll primarily be focused on structured, but in NLP, or sorry, on unstructured, but in NLP, we will focus on unstructured as well. So giving some examples of pruning and trying to make this a little bit more concrete. So on the left, we have a fully connected network, input layer, a hidden layer, and our output layer, and we have the connections in between. After pruning this model, we're going to end up with a not so fully connected layer. So what we've done is remove the weight connections in between these neurons, in between these activations. And that's what we refer to as unstructured pruning. So we kept the overall shape of the network the same, but we introduced zeros into the middle of it. Structured pruning, on the other hand, will remove whole channels, for example, in this network. So we went from five channels in our hidden layer down to two whenever we prune those away. And, um, and, and that can generally be, you know, it's something that can be exploited in, in many places and we'll go through the performance improvements from this, uh, but it's a little bit harder to do and a lot more constrained, which is why we primarily focus on unstructured pruning. So why do sparse models matter? Well, one big thing is faster inference time. And I'll give an example from my past. ResNet 50, a real-time example on a four-core CPU. So I was working with this about seven years ago and uh, working on deployment for an application. We were trying to figure out um, what makes images appealing. And uh, we had trained a ResNet 50 model on it and got through all of the, uh, all the complexities with hyperparameter tuning and everything and ended up with a model that worked fairly well, where we could actually rank images coming in in terms of how appealing they looked uh, overall so that we could filter out the non-appealing ones. What that ended up being though, is it was a few hundred milliseconds per image for us on CPU deployments. We didn't have enough uh, justification to go to GPUs in terms of uh, how much we had coming in and also didn't have much experience with GPUs at the time. So six years ago, seven years ago, we were at a few hundred milliseconds per image and anytime we had a spike coming in, this would significantly grow our queue uh, because we just could not get enough horizontal scaling to make up for the fact that it was taking a few hundred milliseconds per image, right? As soon as you get 
a few thousand images into the queue, you have to scale horizontally a lot to be able to quickly get through that. But today, looking at a sparsified model, it's only a few milliseconds, um, which today, you know, there's been significant improvements on uh, the pipeline as well as the infrastructure, which gives us, uh, which improved over the few hundred milliseconds that it was six years ago, but we still get a 6x performance increase with a sparsified model. So on a four core CPU, this ends up becoming just an API call rather than needing an entire infrastructure to try and serve it. And then finally, for why do sparse models matter, we can get a significant reduction in size. So BERT large is around 1.3 gigabytes and it's prohibitive for most edge deployments. In the past, I've worked with a lot of uh, deployments on edge, uh, VGG 16, whenever that was big, uh, eight years ago. And um, we just could not download the model onto the devices because we were actually restricted from doing so. Uh, once you get over, I believe is 20 megabytes, uh, you have to have Wi-Fi for the download uh, for applications. So with sparsification, we can take that highly accurate for at large from 1.3 gigabytes all the way down to 38 megabytes. So significant improvement. And then additionally, this is what we look at. These are ML perf results that we've uh, published at a BERT large uh, accuracy level. So you can see not just do we get significant pressure improvements, but we get a, we can get all the way up to 175x faster with our model compression technique. So this is why sparse models are really, really important because they remove all those redundancies and then we can exploit that for uh, significant performance improvements. And diving into transfer learning. So let's look at what neural network training is. So we're gonna converge a model onto a data set so we can learn patterns and generalize those patterns for predictions on unseen data, right? Ultimately our problem with ML and AI. So there are generally two types, from scratch and transfer. From scratch, we're gonna start from randomly generated weights. We have our layers all laid out, and then we're going to go through some random initialization procedure for what to start all those weights at. And then we're going to continue training until convergence. And uh, the randomly generate, uh, generated weights can go through a few different methods. There's obviously been a lot of improvements in terms of how to do that to make sure that you have information flowing throughout the network uh, properly. But what it doesn't do is take advantage of uh, some type of pre-initialization like transfer learning does. So with transfer learning, we can start from weights trained on another similar task or data set and therefore leverage the gain knowledge from that task and then continue training until convergence. So what does that do? Why is that important? Well, it gives us a better starting point and fewer hyperparameters too. So for example, without transfer, where we're training from scratch, we're gonna start at zero in terms of our accuracy performance and then slowly converge to our solution, right? But with transfer, we can start at a higher starting point because we're leveraging that pre-gain knowledge from the original network and then quickly converge onto the solution and ultimately end up at a better solution in a lot of cases because it is leveraging that pre-trained knowledge and that knowledge from another data set that uh, can be larger and have more information in that data set for what we're fine tuning to uh, as compared to what we're fine tuning to. So ultimately we can end up with a more accurate model, something that's faster to train and something that takes fewer hyperparameters to do so with. So let's dive into the papers and the results. We have image classification, for example. So we have how well do sparse image net models transfer? And this was out of uh, Dan Alistar's lab, our principal research scientist, with uh, two of his um, PhD students and postdocs, as well as myself on the paper. And we'll walk through motivation and contribution we'll start off with. So first we want to define our standard transfer scenarios because we evaluated two within this. We have linear fine tuning, which is where we're gonna take the hidden layer weights and mass uh, frozen at image net values, and we're going to replace the final layer with dense and train it. So we're taking the entire network, ResNet50, for example, freezing all the weights in there and only training the last classification layer. This is what we consider to be linear fine tuning, because as you can see, since we're only training that last fully connected, it actually ends up just being a linear, um, a linear training process rather than a nonlinear whenever we're training the entire network. Additionally, we have full fine tuning, which we compare as all weights are fine tuned on the downstream task and the sparsity mass is held constant. So rather than just training that last layer, we're going to train every layer inside of it, but make sure that we keep the sparsity mass constant as we're doing sparse transfer. So that means going back to that earlier fully connected network, we're gonna keep all the zeros in the same place, all the connections we removed, we keep removed, but we're gonna update the weights that we didn't remove. 
Now let's dive into leading pruning strategies because we evaluated quite a few here to see what impact pruning before we transferred would have and if the method mattered. And we grouped them into a, three different groups. We have progressive sparsification, uh, which is GMP or gradual magnitude pruning, as well as wood fissure. So for progressive sparsification, what we're doing is we're starting from zero sparsity and continuing to train over several epochs. At each start of an epoch, we're going to remove a certain percentage of weights. So we'll go from, we might start at 10%, then go to 20, 30, and, uh, and so on as we move through the training epochs. What this allows in the progressive sparsification case is a small removal of weights and then allowing the network to recover from that removal of weights. So you allow it to train for some time and all the weights then converge back to whatever the proper solution was and uh, re-rank the weights before we remove again. Additionally, we have regularization-based methods such as ACDC, RIGL, or SCR. Regularization based are going to be something like are going to do some type of reintroduction typically. So they're using some regularization function to consistently reintroduce weights as we're pruning. ACDC, for example, stands for alternating compressing, decompressing. What it's doing is it trains for um, a certain number of epochs, then sets the network to the maximal amount of sparsity, trains for a certain number of epochs, and then relaxes that constraint. So for example, what this would look like is you would train for 10 epochs with no sparsity and then increase your sparsity to 90%, train for 10 epochs, and then reduce your sparsity back to zero, train for 10 epochs. And we alternate that pattern as we go through. Ultimately, what this ends up doing is becoming a um, efficient way of doing weight reintroduction. So we increase sparsity, then relax it and allow the weights to re-rank and adapt to the fact that it was pruned. And then finally, we have lottery ticket hypothesis and those methods. This is where we prune uh, prune the network. Well, we'll train it first, prune the network, and then uh, converge that model at 10% sparsity, for example. And then we'll keep the sparsity mask, but completely reinitialize the weights and start training from scratch again. Right. So we're going to iteratively increase like we were with progressive sparsification, but we're not preserving the weights across each iteration. Uh, so it's takes very long to do, but we, and uh, generally not as efficient, but we include it in here for uh, completeness. And then finally, we have a variety of downstream data sets that we evaluated on. These broke down into two groups. One was general, which is a broad scope, such as CIFAR-10, where we have um, not necessarily a visual um, representation that is similar between the classes. CIFAR-10, CIFAR-100, for example, go across many different classes such as cars and animals and things like that. So there's not a lot visually similar across those in terms of the filters you would want to learn. And additionally, we have specialized, which are narrow scope, such as bird types, right? Different types of birds. And obviously with birds, we have beaks and eyes and feathers and features that can be reused across all the classes. So it's looking, it's learning something that is generally very narrow in terms of the solution on what it's trying to classify. So let's dive into some results. One key thing is that pruning actually preserves the transfer accuracy. This is one of the core results, which is that for all these different sparsification techniques where uh, red is our dense baseline and then blue, orange, and green are different sparsification techniques, you can see that in some cases, um, in some cases, these pruning methods outperform the dense baseline. The green is our wood fisher method. And then uh, orange, I believe, was the lottery ticket, and then blue was standard magnitude pruning GMP. So you can see, especially for green, that it's either performing about the same for all these different tasks as uh, the dense baseline or outperforming it in some cases. And uh, the reason that we saw the out, uh, outperforming was generally happening because it was acting as a regularizer. And this was specifically for linear fine tuning. So to refresh, Linear fine tuning is where we're only training that last layer. So you can see for some of these cases, linear fine tuning didn't do as well, especially for the lottery ticket method, right? For full fine tuning, though, we see a different story where the generally all of these bars are about even across all of the tasks, where we're applying a sparse network and it's converging uh, very quickly back to what the dense baseline was, in some cases ex exceeding it, in some cases dropping a little bit below it, but on average, working out to be nearly equivalent to what the dense was. 
And one other caveat across the full fine tuning, tuning and the linear fine tuning is that we just sub these sparse networks in, substitute these sparse networks in, and kept all of the hyperparameters the same. So seeing if the sparse model is actually a reliable substitute for the dense one. And overall, what we see with these results is that it is. Next was looking at pruning strategies, right? So what we're looking at is the relative error increase at a, at a concerned sparsity level. And this is the average across all the different data sets. You can see for ACDC on linear fine tuning, it outperforms, far outperforms Wood Fisher, for example, uh, in terms of this. So it's able to get to nearly 95% sparsity without any relative error uh, increase or without any accuracy drop. Whereas Wood Fisher did not perform nearly as well on the linear fine tuning. Once we do full fine tuning though, Wood Fisher does outperform by a significant amount, uh, LTH, for example, and, uh, and uh, STR, which are the other progressive methods. So we can get all the way up to 90% with uh, nearly full recovery, and then 95, uh, we, we start dropping a little bit in terms of our relative error increase. So overall conclusion from this is that uh, the pruning methods can matter, and, and we'll go through uh, when you would want to use full fine-tuning versus linear fine-tuning in a little bit. The intuition be behind why Wood Fisher was not doing as well on linear fine tuning primarily came from the fact that Wood Fisher was in general overfitting the architecture to, or at least highly fitting the architecture to whatever loss function was. So it didn't generalize whenever you only had that last layer. It was um, pruning away more general features and keeping more, um, more specific features that mattered for the given loss function, whereas magnitude and ACDC found a more general filter solution and the sparsity maps that are uncovered. Whenever we enable full fine tuning though, this didn't end up mattering because uh, both, both sparsity uh, patterns were able to work across that. And then uh, we had a quick question coming in, which is what data set is being used for these plots? So let me go back real fast um, across these. So these, were, these are the data sets on our X axis. So we have aircraft, birds, Cypher 10, Cypher 100, Caltech 101, and uh, so on. These were some standard data sets that came out of a grouping that Microsoft created. Uh, I forget the exact repo that they had, but uh, if you look into our code base, uh, you'll find it. But they were uh, something that Microsoft had created across as a full summary across image classification data sets. And then the results here are averaged across all those data sets that we just saw um, on that previous one. And then diving into practical speedups for training and inference. So for inference, we'll dive into the results in a little bit, but what's interesting is that whenever we do linear fine tuning, we can actually get speed up for training. And this is because the deep sparse inference engine enables us to get speed up on sparse networks during inference. And because the network is completely frozen other than that last layer, we can run the backbone through the deep sparse inference engine for inference speedups and only train that last layer, which costs very little. So ultimately what you can see here is that we have a change in test accuracy, which is linear fine tuning for ResNet 50 and 90% sparsity, and then the average training time per epoch, right? So the fraction of dense. And overall, what you can see is that sometimes linear fine tuning works well, sometimes it doesn't in terms of the change in test accuracy, but we can see that it has significant performance improvements all the way up to three X improvements uh, for ResNet 50 training. And we'll get into, in the next slide, when we would want to use linear fine tuning versus not using, uh, versus full fine tuning. But overall, what we can see is that we can actually leverage linear fine tuning uh, for, for training speed up and not just inference speed up. And sorry, we'll get into the uh, linear fine tuning in the next slide. So for this one, we look at when regularization based pruning methods excel. And this is looking at the effect of task difficulty on relative increase in sparsity. So we have the relative error increase and the data set difficulty. The data set difficulty is defined by, um, by how the dense model is able to converge. So taking a dense model, what the error difference is for linear fine tuning versus full fine tuning. So using our dense model as a baseline, we can then come up with a, a relative data set difficulty without taking into effect our sparse models. 
So that's just dense comparisons, linear fine tuning versus full fine tuning. That gives us an approximation of how hard each data set is. And we can see for the different methods that uh, what the effect of test difficulty on this relative increase in error is. Um, overall, what we saw was that uh, regularization based pruning methods worked generally better on more difficult tasks and in the um, in the fine tuning. That's what we saw on the other uh, graph as well. We can go back to that one. Uh, for the linear fine tuning, the regularization based methods, ACDC, for example, works generally very well here. And then additionally here, right? So ACDC is doing very well for regularization based methods um, for the linear fine tuning. All right, great. And then we had another quick question that uh, came in, which is, can you briefly talk about sparse, how sparsity is different than dropout during training? And uh, it's a great question. So whenever we're looking at dropout, dropout is affecting activation sparsity, right? So we're going to put a dropout layer in, and it's going to drop out different activations randomly as it's going through. And ultimately, the assumption with dropout is essentially what you're doing is because you're dropping out, for example, 50% of the activations at any given time and randomly dropping that out, you're creating a lot of different uh, networks, mainly because you're evaluating something different each time uh, for what, as you're training. So ultimately, you kind of end up training, the thought process behind it is you end up training an ensemble, essentially, as you're going through with dropout. And the key thing, so the two key things for dropout is one, it's on activation sparsity, and it's not at every layer. And then two, it's randomly generated each time. For pruning, what we're doing is we're affecting the kernels or the parameters, right? We're zeroing out the parameters, and we're keeping a, fis, a fixed mask once we get to inference time. So at inference time, the sparsity pattern is not going to change, right? So essentially we're going to remove a set number of parameters. Those parameters will stay off for the entire time. And therefore it's much easier to get speed up because we have a lot of zeros and the multiplications for the fully connected to the convolutions. Whereas with dropout, we usually just have that at the end of the network and, uh, and just for activations. So it's very hard to get speed up on those because it's not happening at every layer and, um, and it's randomly distributed. Great. And then coming to the summary for this paper, well, uh, what we come up with is if we have a transfer learning task and there are hardware or training time constraints, then we recommend doing linear fine tuning. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then we can break down into the different pruning strategies, which is that if there is a specialized task, uh, which is the uh, fine grain, then sparse regularization works best. So ACDC um, and SCR rig up. If it's a general task though, any pruning strategy will work. So it's generally safer to just do sparse regularization if you're doing linear fine tuning. Uh, otherwise, if there are no hardware or training time constraints, right, you're not on the edge or trying to do federated learning or things like that, then we recommend doing full fine tuning and uh, you won't get the inference speed up, or sorry, the training speed up then, but once we go into deployment, then we'll be able to get the inference speed up. And generally we want to do progressive sparsification, either GMP or Woodfisher, because these outperform the other methods. And then finally, from this paper, we also evaluated image segmentation and detection, and I and I put detection, the detection results in here uh, for brevity. But ultimately, what we evaluated on was yield of V3, yield of V5S, and yield of V5L at different sparsity levels. Looking at cocoa dense versus cocoa pruned, uh, we do see a little bit of a drop for the pruned models on cocoa, and that drop ended up being equivalent to what we saw on the, v on the VOC data set that we transferred to, right? So doing VOC dense transfer from cocoa, and then doing VOC prune transfer from the cocoa prune. Uh, overall, the percent drop was equivalent across these. And we saw this the same for segmentation, which we evaluated on a YOLAC model on, uh, on the cocoa data set as well. Great. And then diving into natural language processing now. So we had a paper that looked not only at pruning method, better pruning methods, in uh, the NLP space, but additionally, how well the sparse transfer work, given how important fine tuning has become in NLP. This was specifically the optimal BERT surgeon. And uh, we had quite a few people from both uh, Dan Alisar's lab at IC Austria, as well as Neural Magic on this paper. Running through the motivation and contributions. 
first was that we introduced a new overt second order pruning method. And what this allowed us to do was target the parameters that least affected the loss. Ultimately, with the second order pruning methods, what we're doing is taking the gradient information that we're getting while training and then creating a second, um, a second order, a Hessian, um, or approximating a Hessian for that. So that essentially what we can do is not only look at which parameters affect the loss least, but additionally, once we remove those parameters, we can actually use that second order matrix to update the remaining, um, the remaining parameters so that it uh, so that the layer each layer individually will match closest to what it was before pruning. So it works out very well, especially for uh, abbreviated pruning schedules, because we are adjusting and adapting those parameters as pruning as as we're pruning. Additionally, we combine this with output distillation, and this guides the pruning process to the correct solution using the original dense model. And actually, it turns out to be very very important on the NLP side to combine model compression with distillation. It wasn't, we haven't seen it as important on the computer vision side, but NLP side, it became necessary to be able to reach high compression ratios. And then finally, we introduced compound sparsification to compare against smaller models. So we introduced layer pruning, which is a structured pruning technique, as well as unstructured pruning, and combined those to see what our results would end up being. And getting into the results for the first, where we're looking at the overt method, we set a state of the art for pruning while fine tuning. So this is after we've transferred. So we take our dense upstream model that was trained in mass language modeling with BERT, and then we transfer it onto our task. For uh, for example, this one was squad uh, v1. We transferred on squad, and then we pruned on the squad data set. And you can see the significant difference that we get for sparsity. So getting to the 99% recovery baseline, before the best was movement pruning uh, out of hugging phase, which got to 70% sparsity, we were able to go all the way up to 90% sparsity. And that makes a huge difference in terms of the inference performance that you're able to get out of this. We go from uh, maybe a two, one and a half to two X performance increase here, all the way up to a potential four, uh, four X or higher uh, performance increase at 90%. So a significant difference in terms of the inference performance that we end up able, uh, being able to get because of the increase in sparsity. As you can see, the lottery ticket papers and sparse bird papers uh, weren't even able to match the baseline at 60%. And the difference between these two lines and movement pruning plus over the shift is actually the difference between distillation being applied. And then the difference between movement pruning and the overt is because of the overt pruning method. And you can see, as I said before, where pruning can act as a regularization method. Uh, this is what we see whenever we're at 70%, where we can actually recover to higher than the original baseline in accuracy. Not only that, but we also set a state of the art for FP32 model compression, right? So not looking at quantization, but just looking at how many parameters we can actually remove, comparing across structured and unstructured techniques. So here's our BERT base, which um, had 85 million parameters and uh, 85.54 uh, F1. Looking at less than six layers, we compared our OBERT, which we removed nine of the layers. So we got down to three layers, uh, BERT base being 12 layer. We removed nine of the layers, got down to three layer, and then pruned it to 90% unstructured. And this out, uh, exceeded tiny BERT, not only in accuracy, but also in compression and in speed up. So tiny BERT being only a structurally sparse network. Additionally, at six layers, where we compare, compare to Distilbert and TinyBert 6, you can see that we outperform um, all of these in terms of the compression breakdown and getting and, uh, and in accuracy, right? So we're almost able to recover to the original BERT base with only six layers and 80% of the remaining parameters in those six layers removed. So significant uh, compression ratio and performance speed up, as well as improved accuracy over to Silver and Tiny Bird. And then finally, at the 12 layers, you can see that we're able to, at uh, 12 layer and 80% sparsity, we're actually able to increase the accuracy from the BERT baseline. So significant improvements across the board in terms of not only the pruning methods, but also generally in terms of model compression and uh, other structured techniques as compared to um, are structured plus unstructured techniques. 
Now let's look at how these methods actually apply to sparse transfer, right? Taking those uh, sparse, unstructured sparse uh, models, for example, we can see that, and uh, there was LTBERT and Prune OFA that both did this, right? So they tried to compare sparse transfer. And you can see at 90%, uh, we far outperform uh, these other results in terms of our transfer abilities and generally getting to within 99% of whatever our baseline was um, at 90% uh, sparsity. And you can see at 97% sparsity, we, uh, for some of these, um, for some of these data sets, even at 97% sparsity, so only 3% of the parameters remaining, we can actually still get very close to what that baseline was. And then finally, looking at the results and impact on deployment. So this is looking at our inference speed as a blue line and uh, model compression as this lower one here. So what we can see is in terms of our percent recovery on F1 recall and the magnitude of improvement for a Y axis. So you can see that we have a significant improvement to the point of about 8x uh, at 99% recovery. And if we want to go even further, where we can get to you know, 90, uh, almost 93% recovery, then we can get all the way up to about 30x. And we've since improved on these methods uh, significantly, so there are better results coming out. But overall, what this shows is that depending on what your deployment scenarios are, there are a range of techniques that you can apply and make sure that you can fit that as compared to the dense baseline. Generally, if you're deploying an FP32 dense baseline model, there's a lot that you can optimize on top of these to get significant improvements in terms of the performance. And then there's another question that came in. When you say unstructured sparsity, do you attain it in practice through mass? If yes, can it lead to inference time improvements? Yes, so definitely. So this is what we're looking at here is that inference time improvement um, where we have an 8x, for example, uh, this is, I believe, our 12 layer 90% sparsity uh, model, or actually that might be our six layer. Um, I apologize, but I'd have to bring up the table. But uh, for example, getting into that 99% recovery, this is actually measured performance for both uh, unstructured and structured. So with the unstructured, we do have a frozen mask that we are leveraging for inference speed up through the deep sparse inference engine. And that's how we're showing these performance improvements is leveraging uh, those sparse masks, those unstructured sparse masks, and be able to leverage that for improved speed ups on uh, uh, CPUs. Yeah, great question. Great. And then moving into conclusion. So you can use or build on our research and, and feel, definitely feel free to do so. We have SparseML, which is on our GitHub. It's an open source repository containing sparsification algorithms and pipeline integrations. And generally you can add sparsification to most pipelines with only a few lines of code. So if you have your own models, you can plug this in with only a few lines of code, uh, create some recipes and recipes are how we encode the hyperparameters around sparsification but it'll enable you to start quantization, to start pruning, doing either unstructured or structured, only with a few lines of code and, um, and some hyperparameter tuning through recipes. Additionally, we have the Spark2, which is a free model repository containing sparse models and recipes for anyone to transfer and apply from. So just as we push out with this research showing how well sparse transfer works, you can take all of our pre-sparsified models, plug them into your data set, train them as you would normally for um, for dense, and you'll be able to get all that performance benefit without having to do any of that hyperparameter tuning. Additionally, we have all the recipes pushed up for how we created those models, so you can use those recipes to adapt to your own models and your own data sets. And then finally, we have Deep Sparse, which is our inference engine that leverages sparsity for significant performance speedups on CPUs. As we were just saying on the previous slide, this allows us to take that unstructured sparsity and turn that into inference time speedups so that you can uh, deploy faster, either leverage that for uh, to get back to your user faster or leverage that to save costs by deploying on smaller instances. And it's free to use for research and community. And then we had another question that came in, uh, which asked by structure, do you mean fi uh, fixed mass or structured in terms of N zeros out of M weights? That's a great question. So let me go back to, uh, this slide. So specifically by structured, what we mean is that we're, we are actually changing the shape of the network. So we're either removing channels or filters. You can think of it as for convolution, 
the matrix shape, the matrix weight shape, and the activation shapes, so we're actually removing um, uh, dimensionality from that. So if you had, so for example, for this fully connected, we went from weights that were, uh, for example, between these two, it was a four by uh, four by five matrix that represented the weights in between here. We turned that into a four by two matrix. So in general, that's what we mean by structure, is changing the actual shape of the network. Uh, additionally, for the structure that we were doing for NLP, what we were doing was removing whole layers in between here. So if we had multiple hidden layers, we were removing whole layers in between and uh, changing it from BERT. BERT base, for example, has 12 layers in it, uh, 12 attention and fully connected uh, groupings, which they call layers. And we would remove either six of those or nine of those, creating a six layer version, something like the Silbert, or a three layer version, which is similar to uh, TinyBERT in, uh, in size. And then by unstructured, we just mean that we're keeping the weight matrices and the overall shape of the network intact and introducing zeros. And in general, these can play together fairly nice, uh, fairly nicely. The difference is for structured pruning, because it is removing whole groups of weights at a time, uh, it's a lot more sensitive. So usually you can only get to maybe 20% sparsity or 40% sparsity before you start affecting accuracy. But unstructured pruning, we can then apply on top of the structurally pruned network and push the sparsity even higher. And then let's see. So we had another one come in. One of your slides mentioned specialized versus general tasks. What tasks were those? And uh, so I believe that would have been here. Yes. So um, this was just specifically how we grouped the different data sets that, uh, that we were looking at. And that was specifically for the end result here, where we're looking at if you had a specialized or general task in terms of what pruning strategy you wanted to use. In terms of um, specialized tasks, this meant something that had very similar features across a data set. So for example, the birds data set is just a collection of different classes of birds, right? So it had um, you know, uh, blue jays and robins and pigeons and doves and things like that in it. So it's a very specialized task because there's a lot of features that are shared across those data sets. A general task is something that is much more general in terms of the classes that it represents. So looking at SciFAR 100, for example, it contains not just animals and birds, but additionally vehicles and um, and forks and, and people and things like that, right? So very different features that the model has to learn uh, to be able to generally recognize any class in that data set versus more specialized tasks, which only need a couple filters uh, because there's a lot of reuse across the classes. And ultimately what that meant is that uh, these regularized, uh, regularization based pruning methods like ACDC and, um, outperformed on the specialized tasks that as compared to any of the other pruning strategies. Great. And then we had another one that came in. How is pruning language models different from pruning CNNs? I asked this to understand why can't the method used to obtain OBERT be used to obtain O of ResNet 50? So it is a great question. And um, actually the latest ResNet 50 results that we have do apply the same uh, second order methods on top of it. The difference is, is that actually for the language models, because they have a lot more parameters in them, you have to make more approximations as you're calculating the second order information. As you're trying to approximate that Hessian, you have to make, you have to essentially take more shortcuts to be able to get something that works for a BERT model because it's much larger as compared to CNNs. But if you look at uh, on our papers on neuromagic.com, we actually do have both Wood Fisher and MFAC, which are the precursors to OBERT that were applied on CNNs. So OBERT was just a um, uh, an ad adaptation to Wood Fisher, to that second order Wood Fisher method, so that it would work with a larger parameter space um, for uh, for these large language models like BERT and, and uh, BERT large and things like that. Um, so definitely check those out. Those are all available, and we may have a future um, a future lunch and learn that dives into that in more detail. But uh, yeah, great question. And then we had another question come in: Does Deep Sparse implement uh, customized sparse kernels for various CPU architecture, or it uses kernels from vendors until on runtime, etc.? Yes. Yeah, so great question, and we just slide down to uh, the Deep Sparse. So for deep sparse, uh, it's all implemented uh, from scratch. We we have a lot of uh, people on the team at Neural Magic 
where we're build, we are building, actively building out our own runtime in Deep Sparse and uh, built on top of the Onyx framework. So any Onyx model that you have will run inside of Deep Sparse. And, uh, but underneath, underneath it, we are implementing our own, uh, our own implementation kernels that, uh, that actually run it as well as the high level uh, graph structure um, to, uh, to be able to get significant performance improvements. So that's all built out by us uh, to be able to leverage the sparsity mask and make sure that we can get uh, performance improvements specifically on CPUs. Not only does it allow speed up on CPUs from sparsity, but additionally, as I was going into for the layouts and things like that, what it's actually doing is leveraging the fact that the CPUs have a cache hierarchy in them. So we have L1, L2, L3 cache, then main memory, and the caches are much faster to access than main memory. So we want to act, uh, hit those caches as often as possible. So we have something called tensor columns built into deep sparse, which isn't available in any of the other runtimes that additionally leverages those caches much more often as compared to other inference engines. So what you end up with is really fast memory access as you're executing these networks, as well as really fast compute from the sparsity. And both of those combine to give you the significant performance improvements that, uh, that we quoted here. Then we have do different kinds of random weight initialization strategies lend to better downstream sparsification? That is a, uh, that is a great question. And um, in general, we haven't explored it in detail. But what I will say from that is that uh, generally, whenever we're sparse, so whenever we're sparsifying a model, we're allowing it to converge first. So converge on the solution first so that it can reorder all the weights and make sure that it's essentially at a stable point in the loss curve before we start pruning it. And um, the accuracy of that pruned model, or sorry, of the dense model before we start pruning it does significantly affect and is extremely correlated with where your pruned model is going to come out. So for example, if you have an inefficient random, uh, random initialization where the model doesn't converge to as high as it does with another random initialization or with another training scheme. So for example, ResNet 50, if it's at 76.1 as a baseline and a different initialization or different training scheme only gets it to 74.3, then that's the baseline you're likely to recover to or maybe beat by a little bit with pruning. So we're not going to significantly improve over the top of whatever the baseline is, uh, if that makes sense. So ultimately, it's going to be correlated with however well the model converges um, in, in a dense case before pruning. All right. And then another question, will you see similar results for VITs? So this is a great question. We actually have some research that we're working on right now. Uh, which will be coming out shortly on VITs. We have seen uh, very successful results on that. It's um, going through review right now. Uh, and, uh, you know, stay tuned for that. Definitely follow us and we'll be uh, pushing that out as uh, as those results get, uh, get published and uh, made public. But uh, overall, what I can say from high levels that VITs, yes, uh, we are able to prune them and it does work very well with, uh, with those as well. And then we also had in the summary slide, you mentioned that based on hardware limitations, you can choose linear or full fine tuning. Uh, is it for training or inference as well? I thought in inference, we can ideally have a same dimensional prune number. Yes. So going through that summary slide for the, um, how well the sparse emission models transfer, this is specifically talking about training only. And this is primarily because whenever we do linear fine tuning, we can actually speed up linear fine tuning because we can treat the baseline of the, the base network that we're running as just a forwards pass, as an inference mode, because we're only um, actually updating the weights for the last layer. Full fine tuning, we can't treat as inference mode because we are updating every weight in the layer. So therefore we do need to do backwards, uh, backwards pass through the entire network. Uh, so that's why the difference comes in here because uh, for linear fine tuning, we can actually get speed ups on training Whereas um, for full fine tuning, we can't. Uh, both of these will generate similar models, or sorry, all of these pathways will generate similar models that uh, will get the same performance on uh, at inference time. It's just a question of, can you get speed up on training? And what is the accuracy that you get out of that? Yeah, great question. All right, great. And then, yeah, so that's everything that uh, that we had to run through. So thank you everyone for joining in and listening. Uh, definitely support our project on GitHub. And this is where all those repos that I mentioned are, github.com slash neuralmagic. Uh, follow and engage with us on neural, uh, at neuralmagic on Twitter 
And then additionally, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have the Neural Magic community Slack, which all of our uh, team is on here at Neural Magic to help out and see if there's any other questions. So uh, thank you everyone for, uh, for joining in. And uh, yeah, if there's anything that you'd like to build on in terms of research or uh, community, definitely reach out and uh, we'd love to partner around anything you're working on. All right, thanks everyone.